Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today I am joined by my good friend, Dr. Philip Chase. Philip, hello, how are you today? Hello, AP. Hello, viewers. It is wonderful to be here, AP, once again on A Critical Dragon. And I think we have an interesting topic in store. Well, we think it's interesting. We do. <laughs> <laughs> This is this is the thing we come up we, when we chat about things it's because we're interested in it and okay. i'm always worried that someone's going to go but why are you guys talking about that you go because we're book nerds and this is what we like doing yeah I, th yep. I thought we could talk a little bit more about reviewing because you had a video on your channel about why you don't use stars and a little bird has told me another reason why you don't do starred reviews which uh -oh. we will get back to. <laughs> um, and I had done a, a video about different ways of approaching reviewing because there isn't any one approach. Um, right. But I think there's a general conversation to be had, not only about what what is a review? What is it that you, we are trying to do with reviews? And yeah. the different techniques that we apply, the different weight that we give various things within that analysis. And also then, I think a bit of a discussion about whether or not there's a difference between reviewing a text or talking about your reading experience of a text. So okay. like those are the, the sort of the general areas that I wanted to talk about. So yeah, uh, yeah. you don't give stars uh, in reviews. And why nope. is that, Philip? Well, first I want to say, because it's going to come up in the comments, the reason we're both dressed like this, a little more dressed up than usual, is we're both just coming back from work. So in <laughs> case anyone was going to ask, and I, I'm pretty sure that was going to come up, yes, we, we, we are just coming from work and finding the time to do this, so that's why I'm not wearing a t-shirt, so yeah. And uh, why don't I give stars? So briefly, I uh, made the analogy in my video with the college that I went to, which is unusual here in the United States in that it does not give grades. Instead, it gives written evaluations. So no letters, numbers, no B, C, A, whatever. Instead, we have pages written about us at the end of the semester by the professor. We do pages of self-evaluation and reflecting on what we've learned and where we want to go with this knowledge and what we want to do and how it relates to our lives. and. And it's just it's a very interdisciplinary approach as well in that you you'd often have different uh, where you would have traditional disciplines completely siloed at most other colleges, you have these team taught courses and it's just a very different approach to education. So no exams, no grades. Instead, these I found very meaningful written evaluations where we would reflect on what we did. And the goal there is is deep learning is transformative learning rather than the rote learning or the um, bulimic learning which you would get which would be encouraged by exams and grades where the student just wants to get an a and we'll do whatever it takes and we'll cram for the test and then regurgitate you know so i've personally found that a, a approach to education with the written evaluations and so forth to be very meaningful very liberating and I felt that it was conducive to a deeper, more meaningful experience. I have a similar feeling about when I review uh, books, I like to read what people think about the book. I like to, to hear how they engage with the themes. I like to hear how the, the, um, what they think of the characters, whether they're flat or round or static or dynamic, or the, how the setting contributes to the story, how the narrative perspective. All of these parts of the story come together to make the story. And it's fun for me, and I know for you, to kind of take that apart and to look at what makes this work. Why is this effective? Why could this be maybe better? How is this related to other stories that use the same themes or the same tropes? Uh, these are questions that fascinate me, and I find them very interesting. So that's why I, I got into this. That's why I do what I do on YouTube, and that's why I do what I do for my professional life. I, I find this all very fun and interesting and important, I, I think, too. So, well, you know, yeah, that, that, you know, that makes a lot of sense to me, because yeah. obviously 
you know, I used to teach at a university as well. Right. But you, you skipped out the major reason that you don't give star reviews on your channel, which is you want to be the only star there. <laughs> well, I mean, Dr. Fantasy does shine, uh, you know, so I, I can't help it. But but, but uh, yeah, so the, the no stars thing. I want to make it clear. I am not in any way saying stars are bad, that it is, you know, that it is in any way uh, destructive or or that it is any way uh, dumb or anything to use stars. I understand. I think I understand. And um, I had a lot of great feedback on my video, by the way, by people who give star ratings. And so I, I think that they do serve a purpose. One, they're fun. People like to, to engage in giving stars because they like to compare what other people give to the same book and they like to compare what they give to other books. And, and in that sense that in the sense that it's fun for them, it is meaningful. So I don't want to take away from that. Um, so that's all well and good. Well, I don't I, think anyone would think that you're saying no one else is allowed to do it because right. like one of the primary things that we constantly talk about is there are lots of different ways of doing things. This is how I do it. Yeah, and yeah. other people do it different ways. And exactly. we're not enforcing, well, I don't enforce how I approach literature on other people. I show okay. people how I approach literature because exactly. people have asked. And that's um, the goal. That's the goal of my video was just to say, this is what I do and here's why. And I'm perfectly fine with other approaches to this. In fact, if everybody did what I did, it would be a very boring world, trust me, so. <laughs> well, yeah, you, and also you'd never get a time on the tennis court, but. That's true. <laughs> uh, but I, I take your point. The, the analogy to student essays is actually, I think, very apt because when, one of the things that we find or that I find when I was teaching was you'd grade a paper. So yeah. a student would submit an essay and you sat and sometimes like 40 minutes going through annotating and writing notes and uh, corrections and pointing out where they had gone wrong. And you handed it to the student. And the first thing the student did was they looked at the number on it for their grade, the grade. they look at the grade and then went and stuffed it in their bag. Yeah. Why did I spend so long showing and going through everything that, you know, the bits that they had done well and the bits that they had done badly, writing up a comprehensive uh, cover page with all of the, the sort of the summary notes? Yeah. Why did I even bother? I could just scroll a, a number or a letter on it and throw it at them. And yeah. part of the, the issue with this is sometimes when a, a number or a grade gets assigned to something that's what people focus on and not how that is actually reflective of other qualities because when you look at websites like uh, amazon or goodreads or even yeah. uh, on a uh, a bookstore's actual site where you you can you can add your own review or you can add your own um feedback about certain books they give you the option to put in stars and when you scroll through them, you generally get, it'll give you the aggregate. This is the average rating that this product got. So this yeah. has a thousand five stars and only two one stars. Therefore, it's a good product. Right. And you're not actually looking at the reviews. You're looking at the aggregate of a score. And because people rate things differently, because people have different criteria, yeah. And they weigh those criteria in terms of what is the most important, what is the least important, what are they yeah. going to put up with in something and what are they not going to put up with, that a lot of online reviews are actual, just it's a star rating, and then whether or not they liked it. And the, so this is the thing. Yeah, this is an issue, perhaps, um, if we're going to talk about, you, you brought up a couple important things. One, I, I think you're right about the... I think pretty much every educator can testify to this phenomenon of not all, but many students who will just flip to the grade and look at the grade and then put away the thing and never look at it again. And that's not conducive to a, a, a good learning experience. So the grade gets in the way, in other words, of, yeah. of something more important, which is engaging on a deeper level with what you're trying to analyze. In, in one case, the student's writing, and the other case, possibly, I think it probably does happen that people, even if you do write a meaningful, meaningful review, but you also leave a star rating, a lot of people might just look at the stars and, and just stop there, you know. So that's a possibility. I, I, I will admit that that can happen. The other thing is, 
I'm very interested in what you were talking about, about the, the aggregate, the averages of all of these stars. And if some people give stars based on how much they enjoy the book, okay, that's fine. That, that's how they operate, great. But other people might give stars based on how well they think the prose is or how well the author does characters and maybe didn't enjoy the book, but thought, you know what, this, this, these are good characters. So I'm gonna give it a higher rating. Whatever the case, there are just many, many, many different ways of assigning stars, I think that's fair to say. Yeah. So if you're throwing those all together in one pile and saying, here's the average, how meaningful is that average? Because you have different, totally different criteria for assigning yeah. stars in the first place. So my problem with going on these sites like Goodreads or Amazon and, and then going with, oh, okay, I see this, this book has a, an average of four stars, so it must be good. I don't really know why all these people are giving these stars. So I, I just wonder how useful that is as an exercise. And, and even when you look at a lot of the, the review, the written review that they have put underneath, it can sometimes yeah. be three or four sentences. Right. And, you know, I, I have a channel on which I have taken one paragraph of text and spent half an hour talking about it. <laughs> yeah. Now, I appreciate that that's maybe a little extreme, but three or four sentences for an entire novel seems a little light to me, um, right. that you're not really grappling with any sort of in-depth analysis. And usually, right. and uh, when they are that incredibly short sort of summary things, it'll be things like, this book is is crap, This book, I don't like this book, this book was right. rubbish. Right. You know, that is insightful commentary. Please tell me more. Um, yeah, and, and that, that 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 review is counted just as much in the aggregate as a really thoughtful review that takes into account, you know, all the nuances. And so th they're given equal weight in in these averages that you're looking at. So that's pro you know that could be problematic as well. So uh, there are there are issues because there's no there's no one way to mm. approach a text. Um, right. And uh, I actually, it, I have a, one of the things I talked about, which I, I think, it, it, I, can't, I don't know who came up with it, but I know it was Christian from Dark Portents actually had told me about this particular system. Uh -huh. And, you know, it, it's not perfect, but it's actually quite an interesting system. And I thought we could talk about that because I can put it up on the screen and we can talk through it. Oh, cool. Because there's so many different ways of approaching it, because um a lot of what we like or don't like in a book is so rooted in a personal approach mm -hmm. that un unless you are and I, I don't mean this in an elitist way but unless you are trained in literary analysis or you are trained as a critical reviewer right. unless you have that training and that and that expertise being able to separate yourself from an analysis of the of the work it's sometimes incredibly difficult because yeah. it's even hard things, if you are trained, I think. Yeah. Oh, and even even when you are trained, it still influences you. But the thing is, you're always you're always aware of it and you're always trying to uh, not let it influence your assessment as, as much as possible. Sometimes right. you're more successful than others. But right. like, here's a question. Have you ever had the the occasion to review a book? that you personally did not like, but that you actually give it a pretty positive or a very positive review. Mm -hmm. Like, have yes. you ever had to do that? Yes, yeah, of course. Right, yeah. now, some people might go, oh, but that's very hypocritical. And I've, I, cause I've done, I've, I've done exactly the same thing. So right. I can give you my reason for why it's not hypocritical. And I'm just, I'm going to be curious now as to see if it matches up to yours. Yeah. And um, one of the things is when, and depending on the type of review that you're doing, and I was reviewing for a journal and they'd asked me to review this thing. I went through it. I looked at the, um, the pros, the quality of the writing on a technical level. And yeah, what, yeah. was it good writing? I looked at the characterization. I looked at whether or not the piercing flowed well for this style of narrative that it was. Mm -hmm. I, I was looking at all of these different elements and all in all, it was actually a really, really good 
example of all of this stuff. Yeah. I just didn't enjoy it. I wasn't in the mood for it. It wasn't the type of story that I wanted to read. And to be perfectly honest, it's not a, a an author or a, a genre that I was planning on ever picking up again. But wow. I'd been asked to review it and I had to give it a fair review. And the review was about how good the book was, not right. about whether or not I liked it. Right. And that I think, and I know for a lot of people that's gonna sound really weird because how we read quite often as academics, as reviewers, as critics, yeah. it's very different to when you read for personal pleasure because when you're reading for personal pleasure, pleasure, entertainment yeah. is the core reason you're reading. And right. that's not always the case because sometimes we read stuff because it's important to a genre or important to the history of a development of something. And you right. read these books because they are important and you are engaged and interested and intrigued by aspects of it. Ultimately, like the story falls flat or it's not the thing that you would, you know what, I'm going to sit down and read this. This will be a lot of fun. Right. It's not that. It's more of an intellectual engagement with it. Yeah. And so I give it a very positive review, but personally, I disliked it. And yeah, yeah. at no point did I feel hypocritical in any way because it, the review wasn't about whether or not I liked it. It was a review of the book, not a review of my reading experience. So it was text centric rather than egocentric. Right, interesting, yeah. So as an educator, I might have the, an advantage in a way because I'm always reading essays that I'm supposed to assess and whether or not I agree with the position being staked out in the essay is totally irrelevant actually. Yeah. Uh, I, I have to assess the essay on its merits. How well is it argued? How well is it written? You know, um, so I, I look at those measurements and I try my very best to be unbiased uh, when I'm assessing. So I think you can take a similar approach that what you're talking about with to a book and you can you can strive for objectivity um, and no, no, you know, no one's capable of being entirely objective, but you can be more objective <laughs> than less objective. And that's not to say that there isn't value in letting people know how much you enjoyed a book. There's, there's value in that, especially if you're part of a community and uh, people know you and they like to read similar things to what you read. Uh, so it, it, there is a social aspect to that, I think, that is valuable as well, extremely valuable, and that people like to bond and share over their experiences. And a lot of that is, is just, you know, exuding and, and being enthusiastic or, you know, in the opposite direction, kind of, you know, I personally don't enjoy doing this, but some people like to rant and, and talk about how much they didn't like a book, you know? Sorry, or some people like to rant. Was that a <laughs> dig at me? Well, I could say Man of Steel. Uh, I <laughs> so you know it. It wasn't actually intended as a dig, but it worked out pretty well. Um, so, but yeah, I, there is value in that too, and we can do both things. Sometimes I think even you can do both simultaneously. I think it's good to be aware of which you're doing though. When and, and right? that's I think that's the big thing. Yeah. being aware of it so not just going well this is what yeah. i'd spewing forth all of this thing and go but that's what a review is you go no think about it be aware of what it is that you're doing and right. a classic example of this um my brother will ask me if i've i've watched a recent film what did you think of the film <laughs> yeah. and I'll, I'll talk about cinematography, I'll talk about the acting, I'll talk about editing, I'll talk about uh, the, the color and the, the framing of things. I'll talk about movement and, uh, and he'll go, no, no, I just want to know, like, did you like it? And I go, he wants, well, why did you ask me? he wants a star rating from you. But I said, why did you ask me what I thought about the film <laughs> when what you wanted to know was how I felt about the film? Yeah, he should know better, AP. Um, and, and it's weird. If you think about it, if I said, what do you think of this book? I'm asking yeah. about your thoughts. Right. But if I say, how do you feel about this book? I'm asking about how it made you feel, your emotions, yeah. your response. And right. there, you can see that those are two different things. One is asking about your analysis of the book 
and yeah. focusing on what the book is doing. And the other is asking about how the book made you feel, how you responded to it. Right. So it's focused more on on the self. Yeah. And you, there are two different I, things. Yeah. Are, yeah. are they important? Yes, they, they are both important things. But I wouldn't say, oh, it's only this thing. Right. You know, you, being aware that there are these different approaches, I think, is very, very important. And you can even have you combine them into a fully rounded perspective where you start with a lot of analysis and you finish with how it all when it came together, how it made you feel. And you're covering the yeah. best of both worlds. And yeah. I, I don't know why um, my, my brother insists on the only important thing is how you feel about it. And yeah. But I, I equally, I don't insist that uh, the only way to think about a book is how to think about it rather than how to feel. Because yeah. as long as you're aware of it, as long as you know what you're doing with your review and what you're trying to communicate, and that is clear to your audience. So, and that's going back temporarily to star reviews. If someone gives a star review based on how they felt, right, and someone else is giving a star review based on what the book was actually doing, that they could be very, very different. Things. Actually, and even if the same person did it, the way that we were just mm -hmm. talking about separating right. how you feel from um, your analysis, because right. as educators, and you know, it, it's probably the same with parents. Parents will always say, uh, I don't have any favorites among my children. I love them all equally. And as educators, of course, we love all of our students equally. We think they are all just as special as one another. Yeah, absolutely. But you cannot let that influence how you grade an essay. You, right. you have to be as objective as possible about the work because it is otherwise it is unfair to students. And if I can do that for an essay and for legal cases, lawyers do it all the time. It's not about whether or not they like the client. It's not about whether or not they firmly believe that this is the, the right thing. It's they go, this is the argument that I can construct mm. and you can have lunch with the lawyer on the other side, even though you're arguing in court backwards and forwards, but you can be perfectly cordial outside of court because that's work. That's a job that's separate from how you feel. That's right. the intellectual battle. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it's a curious thing. I think a lot of this is uh, semantics as well because i don't know that we have an agreed upon definition of what a review is even and and maybe that's for the good because i i like the diversity of of you know approaches to evaluating books that you can find for example on youtube i i enjoy that i i sometimes want to hear somebody's personal feelings and i think even that star ratings can be a, a fun part of expressing your personal feelings, how you, how you felt while experiencing this story. Um, so that, that has a place, it has value. Um, but I, I often think that there is a lack of clarity um, in terms of what, uh, what, what we're doing, you know, and, and are we doing, re is this a review? Is this an analysis? Is this a discussion, right? I mean, we have lots of chats, you and I, about books and about television shows and things. And the two of us don't think these are reviews. Well, other no, they're not. Might, other people might think that they are, but we we proceed believing that these are discussions, actually. So there's a lot of semantics in here, I think, that it I don't have the, the right definition of a review. So I'm not trying to say that, but I, I think it's interesting how I think a lot of the times when we circle around and we have this argument, we're we're kind of thinking of these things in different terms and we're not we don't have a common definition and maybe that's part of the issue well, and that we we argue across purposes but this is one of the like people always go on about academics being so obsessed with defining your terms and defining things you go this is exactly why because right. if, if i'm arguing about genre fantasy and you're arguing about the genre of fantasy and uh -huh. it sounds very similar and you go no those are two very different things right and so an argument that makes perfect sense for me, you're going, but that argument, that makes no sense at all. You've forgotten X, Y, and Z. And I go, no, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about genre fantasy. And you go, yes, the genre of fantasy. 
and you end up arguing across purposes uh yeah. prominent and, and excellent arguments are nonsensical when placed in the wrong context so yeah. i think that's that's why we tend to focus on stuff like that because we're mm -hmm. we're well aware of it in how we've been trained that you have to be clear and aware of what exactly it is that you're doing yeah um whereas when when you and i chat we're much less formal about it like we we sit and we have discussions we have discussions about the things we talk about what we like what we don't like and then yeah. we slip into perhaps a more structural analysis or we, we apply Go back and forth. Lens. yeah yeah but if we were writing a formal review or constructing a review. This is my review of this. You have right. a structure to it. You have, I'm going to go through these points and it's building towards this. And this is a breakdown of that. And it, it's much more structured, much more formal than yeah. a casual chat where you go, oh, what about that thing? You go, oh, yeah, that's a great point. Let's, let's talk about that. That's informal. Right. Regardless of the, the register in, in which, with which we discuss things or the, the lexicon we deploy, um, it's an informal discussion, but a review, again, regardless of the lexicon or register being used, is is a formal thing. And um, chatting to your friends is one thing. Right. Recording or writing a review is a different thing. Yeah. So when we have our chats, there's a social dimension to those chats that we have a good time. We 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 goof off a little bit. We have fun, and that's part of the experience. Just a wee bit. Um, so, and that's part of it. And that's, you know, that's a fun aspect of this. So I do want to recognize, and I also want to say, I just think it's a, it's a great thing that people are out there wanting to talk about books and reading books at all. I mean, just however they want to do that. That's great. I want to celebrate that. Um, and that's fantastic. Um, yeah. but, but, I, and that's, but that's why discussions like this, I, this is not call, it's not calling people out or no. We, we love books. Yeah. That's why we ended up in the professions we ended up in. <laughs> yeah, um, we love talking about books and yeah. being part of a community that loves talking about it as well. You go, that's even better. Yeah, so yeah. we're talking about it. It's not lecturing people saying you're not allowed to do that. No one is gatekeeping. The internet democratized everyone's opinion. Yeah. But the, <laughs> the issue with that is Right. So everyone has an opinion. Great. Are there ways that we can learn from that? Well, I can learn from how someone else does it. They can learn from me, whether or not they use my th uh, my techniques or, or want to listen to that sort of thing. That's fine. They might go, no, I know exactly what not to do. Right. Because more knowledge is helpful. Yeah. And it's part of that discussion. Um, none of this is insisting that you do it one way or another right. and i cert i certainly have a personal preference for reviews i i have the right. styles that i like just as everyone else has styles that they like i have styles i like to use i have styles that i like to consume you right know, i'm just as entitled to enjoy those and i'll have those be my preference as anyone else is to have their preferences. Absolutely. Yeah. And you, you're too modest to mention it, but you've written award-winning reviews before. I know you don't do reviews now, you don't do them on your channel, but you have done some incredible, really astute reviews. So it is something you know about. Um, but it, I do find it interesting that we are now having fun in this medium here called YouTube. And it is a very powerful tool. You think about it, AP. I have maybe 100 students a semester, OK? That's 200 students a year. So I, I get to touch the lives, and it's a privilege. It's an absolute honor and a privilege to do this of 200 people a year as an educator. Just pause as for a, a second. Just pause for a second there. I'm yeah. so glad that you added the word lives after that. I get to touch the lives of my students. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. All right. Fireball has passed now. <laughs> yes, yes, of course you knew what I meant. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, yes, as a booktuber, and this is something I was talking about with Mike recently of Mike's book reviews. Never mind uh, him. I mean, he has 60,000 plus subscribers. 
that's how many people he influences to read books okay i have you know i, I have a, a smaller channel than that which is fine um because he does a lot of things really well that i'll never be able to do but you know the fact is i still i still interact with way more people now on booktube than i do in my classrooms which is actually astounding to me but uh it's also kind of cool because we now have this tool where we can reach all these people and we can discuss books in the way that you and I like to do and add some fun. I've, I've learned from BookTube too, actually, so, you know, how to, how to be more fun, you know, um, go back and watch my first couple of videos, which are incredibly stiff and boring. Uh, so it, it's interesting how I, I, I do think this is a very important and valuable tool where uh, you can do some really I think great analysis that will be helpful to lots of people. And that was really why I started the channel in the first place uh, was to try to just get that out there to, to say, look, we can do. And not that everyone who does, you know, booktube needs to do this at all. I'm not saying that. But what I wanted to do was show that the fantasy genre has plenty of great stories in it that are worth exploring critically. And that's what I enjoy doing and I have fun doing. Um, so, uh, yeah, but uh, it is not necessarily, I can combine the more social aspects of what I've found on BookTube with that. And hopefully that's something that is appealing to people. So I don't know. I mean, I just think it's a, it's a powerful medium. And, and, and I think clarity is a good thing just to, to know, okay, what I'm doing here is combining a more analytical approach to with, with a, a more social fun thing where I, maybe I give stars or I, you know, I go off and, and, and talk about how I, I gush, you know, I'm just gushing about how I love this book and how it was so emotional. I do that in my reviews. I absolutely do include that sort of thing. And that's good. I, I think we connect with people that way. Um, so, yeah. But and this is a, and again, I think that that's an excellent point that we are, I have ended up, my channel's even smaller than yours, let alone Mike's. Uh -huh. But yeah. um, looking at the number of watched hours on my channel for the last year, yeah. that, is, that is far in excess of the amount of contact time that I ever had teaching students. And that is a phenomenal amount of power to, to be able, to yeah. influence negatively or positively someone's view of how to read literature, how do you engage with this stuff? And mm. it, it's an, an, an amazing responsibility and it's, it's wonderful to be able to communicate with all of these different people. Yeah. But I think one of the, one of the key differences is none of my things are actual formal lectures. I, formal lectures are, are structured very, very differently. And they're not even a lot of the, the informal, um, class discussions, because again, that, that's a more didactic framework. Um, right. And it's set up then for class participation and where you talk about like uh, flipping the classroom and engaging in exercises and building all of these things. And there's a whole uh, pedagogical as aspect to it that obviously oh, yeah. we don't do in videos because it's right. not going to work that way. Yeah. And so this is a lot of my stuff, even though it's like me talking about a, a narrative concept or talking through something. Um, my that's at a, a much more informal level than my lectures ever were, right? Uh, but which may shock some people who have watched my channel. <laughs> um, Any and, diegesis and, said anyone? Yeah, yeah. It, it's but it's it's amazing because I, I love having these conversations because this is stuff I didn't. It wasn't like I was born knowing all of this. People took time right. to yeah. teach me, and so. Do I keep all of that knowledge to myself or do I share it? Exactly. And you go, and that's what I love about this community on YouTube. We share perspectives. We talk yeah. about the, the genre with the diversity of authors, the diversity of stories, the range of different fantasy stories now that we get to consume. We are literally living in a golden age yeah. of fantasy publishing. And that is a, an incredibly good thing. 
And it's the same with the diversity of voices that we find, the different approaches that we have to analyzing and understanding literature. Mm -hmm. It is an incredible joy yeah. when, and it, it happened uh, the other day on, on Twitter, someone had posted an essay that they had written about one of Stephen Erickson's books. Uh -huh. And I read this essay and I hadn't considered looking at the part of the thing that they were going through yeah. Uh, the way that they did. And so it added to my knowledge. Yeah. It added to my experience of the text. Yeah, I know and, the essay and it's brilliant. Uh, same thing for me. Yeah. yeah. And th this is, is what I love, these, these different perspectives. And so I have never suggested that you must do it this way. Right. Quite the contrary. I've heard people saying, oh, no, but this is how you do a review. And I've never said that. Right. Right. Um, I don't make those claims yeah, because no. I have no right to, the, to make those claims. Yeah. <laughs> you review the way that you're going to review, but isn't yeah. it nice when you're given more tools, different approaches that you can use that you then get to decide instead of reviewing that way, why don't I try this, this, and this instead? Or I can add that into my review style. You know, there you go. Having more tools to do the thing is that not what we're aiming for? Absolutely. So in, I'll give myself as an example. I gained tools as a result of engaging on BookTube. I, under, I understand a little better, um, and not that I'm the most uh, graceful person socially, but I understand a little bit better how to make my, my videos, my reviews, my discussions more interesting for more people. And that's a good thing. And that actually has even bled into my teaching. I think it's helped me be a slightly better educator as well to keep my students engaged. Hey, that's a win. If I can, or someone like you can offer me new tools in terms of analysis, new terms. I make fun of you for saying diegesis, but I think it's a great term actually. It's very useful to be able to distinguish between the elements that are part of the story within the story and then oh. <laughs> so you were saying it bled into your teaching there's a there's a still a photograph of you teaching that's me <laughs> good grief <laughs> wait first it was um it was uh darth Sidious, and and now it's voldemort i don't know what you're talking about philip <laughs> those those are those were photographs of you uh-huh <laughs> Someone has uh, discovered how, how to, to play with um, uh, Photoshop and other fun little little tools on his computer, I think. Um, so <laughs> YouTube has taught me many things. I see that you've picked up a few things from YouTube, AP. That's wonderful. <laughs> so I, I have no idea what I was saying, but I'm sure it was something. You were really talking about how wonderful it is to know terms like diegesis. Yes, yes. So it is wonderful to know these terms. You've, you've increased my, my, you made my toolbox bigger. And that's great. We, we can learn from different people on YouTube. And I also think, though, that I, I said this earlier, but it's an important point. Clarity is important. So knowing that what I think it's helpful for people to know what I am doing right now is I'm, when I'm gushing about a book and I'm expressing how much I love it. I am doing something that is basically central to me that and my personal experience. I am relating my how I as a reader experience the book. And there's that's great, but be aware that you're not you're not analyzing then. You're simply kind of sharing your emotional experience. Or if I'm stepping back a little bit, and I can do this in the same review, by the way, you can combine these things. So if I'm trying to do a little bit, something more uh, analytical, I use some of those tools that uh, you're, you're talking about all, a lot on your channel. And sometimes I use on mine. So it's valuable to have all these tools. And I think it's enriching to have them and to have access to them. Um, so it's a wonderful thing, but it's also good to know, okay, this is, it, it gives you more versatility, I think, as, as somebody talking about, you wanna call yourself a reviewer or not, okay? Somebody who talks about books and just to have that versatility is, is wonderful, I think. Yeah, well, I wanted to, sh to share here the, um, the core pile approach to reviewing. Okay. And, 
and again, it, it was Christian from Dark Portents had introduced me to this, and uh, I'm I'm sure it comes from somewhere. I just don't know where it's from. Okay. Um, but I'll, I'll put it on the screen here, and I genuinely will show this instead of a, a joke. Uh, <laughs> I'm dreading what's going to come up here. <laughs> no, but the reason, no, uh, basically what, what you do is uh, you assign a value of one to 10 for each of the different sort of categories, uh -huh. add them together, uh, divide obviously by seven to give you a value now uh, out of 10, and ah. then you divide that by two, and that gives you your star rating. That's okay. that's how they do this, and you can see from from how they broke. They have chosen a, a breakdown of uh, characteristics categories that are would be different uh, from a lot of the ones that I would use, mm -hmm. um, or I would use a lot. But some of them are the same. So like characters, atmosphere, writing style, uh, the plot. But it's then intrigue and. Uh, Presumably that, uh, I, I don't know, I haven't really looked into this, but engagement with, and then logic Period. and relationships, depending on the type of story it is. Okay. But huh. each of those things, and there's a reason why I've color coded them this way. Each of those things is something in the book. Whereas right. the last thing, enjoyment, right. they have separated out as a different thing. So mm -hmm. when you're talking about characters for the purpose of this approach, it is not about how you enjoy the characters or whether you like the characters. That is mm -hmm. not what this approach is assessing because that falls under enjoyment. Right. right. It's not about whether or not you enjoyed or um, liked the atmosphere that was created. This is asking you to assess the creation of atmosphere. What sort of atmosphere was it? What did it do? Hmm. not whether or not you enjoyed it. The enjoyment has been separated out as a separate and distinct and important and equal to the others category. Yeah. And so you can see this is what we were, we were kind of talking about, that you can have a text-centric approach and the top part of this approach would be text-centric. Yes. But the last category is egocentric. It is focused on the self. Right. But if you did a review was, how did I feel about the characters? Did I like the characters? Did I enjoy the atmosphere? Did I like the writing style? That's all enjoyment then. Yeah. That's all about how you enjoyed the text. That's right. one thing. That's one aspect. And I think this is such a brilliant illustration of, of what I have tried to articulate in the past about being uh, text centric or egocentric. Um, yeah, it's a good list. I, I mean, you could add things to that list. Certainly, I would want to have themes on there somewhere myself. Uh, yeah. And there are many other things, you know, the narrative uh, elements, such as, you know, what kind of narrator do you have? So you, you could add to that list, keep what's there. I'm not entirely sure what they mean by intrigue. Um, but... and, and I'm sure that I'm, I'm sure there's a whole explanation of it uh, somewhere. Yeah. But yeah. It was more the, the general concept of that approach. I actually quite enjoy as a, yeah. A, yeah. a review style for a general audience, because right. that way you, you start with all of the elements about telling your general audience what mm. the book is about, what is in the book, how it functions. So it's tech centric. And then because it's a general audience and you want audience engagement, you want to feel part of the community, you want to communicate that you then reveal your personal approach to it and whether or not you enjoyed it. And that is one element of the review. And obviously you can change those categories. Like I, the video I did, I was talking about, like, you select different yeah. criteria. Exactly. And whichever criterion you have selected, you can have a very personal, it could be as ludicrous as, um, you know, the number of cup holders in a car was the example I gave of, of a very idiosyncratic personal thing. So in a in a text, you go, I hate or I, I always want to see um, people with green skin. There have to be people with green skin in it. Were there people with green skin in this book? No. Then it gets a demerit because it didn't have for whatever <laughs> reason. There's something that is personal to you that you think is very important. So not a general category, but a very personal category that can be added in. No one is saying you can't do that. But what I like about this is the idea of structuring a review with 
a number of different categories that are about the text. Yeah, well, so that, that the, makes it uh, that makes it more purposeful, doesn't it? That's the the point I was trying to make earlier too about knowing what you're what it is you're doing. Ha have all these tools; they're great, but be more purposeful and aware uh, of how you're you're going about it. So I think that that having a list like that, and not that you have to do every review, check, 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 check along what's important to you, and maybe if the uh, you know, the setting isn't that important at the moment to talk about, you don't have to talk about it. But if it is important, it can be one of the elements that you discuss, right? Yeah, and well, and I was gonna say that applying something like this rigidly has right. the benefit of then if you, achieve, if you have a star rating, you're right. going to be consistent, you not consistent. necessarily objective, but you're gonna be consistent in how you award stars. Yeah, yeah. But that i would never take a framework like that for the analysis of narrative yeah. uh, and apply it rigidly i would have a whole series of criteria and you see which ones are applicable to the text because right. Right. you uh, one of the the things here uh, one of the things that generally gets talked about a lot with say fantasy would be setting and maybe world building depending on how they're broken out but setting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you can have a very localized story that is a fantasy story, but it's in one building. Right. And you go, well, there's not a lot of setting there, is there? There's not a lot of world building there. It's a very self-contained story. So what is it gonna score really low down on that? Yeah. And that's going to hurt its rating, but you go, but the setting is not the focus of the narrative. Exactly. The setting was appropriate for the type of narrative that it was in, and yeah. therefore it's entirely appropriate it's absolutely fine. It shouldn't be a demerit because it's not doing setting as an equal weight to character. So that's, yeah, so that's my problem with the rigidity. If you're going to have to stick to those same categories every time, it's, you're, it's not going to be a, a, a very helpful exercise because some books like Piranesi, for example, the settings in one building, right? Um, mm -hmm. So would it be penalized even though that's, you know, it's not, the point is not to have this massive epic scale, uh, you know, vast world laid out before you. That's not the point. Um, so to me, it makes, for me personally, it, it just makes more sense. I, I give up the consistency in order to have a, a, a um, an experience. Level of flexibility. Yeah, to have the flexibility, exactly. Where I can talk about the elements that, makes sense to talk about in the context of that particular story. Yeah. So I, I, I lean more toward the flexibility in, in that case. And I, I get why, and that's another reason why I don't want to do stars because I don't want to be tied to the same elements every time. And to be consistent with my star ratings, I would have to do that, so. And, and eventually it, it, it then ends up feeling arbitrary rather than um, yeah. a true reflection of the text. But like all of these things, I think something like this is a great way to start because yeah. if, that, if that's how you start and approach your review and you work through it and you go, huh, I ended up here with a really low score. And that seems strange because why was it so low? And you can see the different elements. You go, but that element really wasn't that important. Yeah. And so it, it can even illustrate to you what a text is doing it, it gives you greater insight into those different elements so yeah. I, I think having systems like that having a criteria like that laid out can be really really useful when you're analyzing sure but i i don't think um that once you're used to it once that you've done that first step i don't think you need to be beholden to it um, I much prefer having that flexibility to take a step back and go, wait, this was, there was one single character in this story, one. Yeah. So it, there's not going to be any character relationships. There's not going to be dialogue. There's not, not going to be any of these things. And yet it was a truly compelling story. But am I giving it a, a two because there was only one character that it just, right. it didn't have this range of characters. Um, you can see why, an arbit depending on the narrative it can be very arbitrary right and while that gives you a consistency in what the star rating generated is 
I prefer things like this as a first step tool, a foundational tool sure. to do your first round of analysis to sort of give you a, a breakdown of different categories, the ones that you think are important because you don't have to go with the ones that were on that list. Yeah. And once you start with that, because I think by this stage, you and I both do it automatically. Yeah. Like we, we, have, we have checklists like that that are just running in our head the entire time. Yeah, it's um, insane what's going on in these brains. <laughs> well, sometimes. Other times, it's just like a little cartoon character going, da 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 <laughs> Oh, look, AP zoomed out again. <laughs> Philip's obviously talking about Beowulf. Um, oh, ow, ow, zinc. <laughs> I think I've got some scorch marks from that one. Ooh. But, but this is the like even um, if you remember when we first were undergraduates studying English literature and they went, this is how you do an essay. This is how you approach it. Yeah. When was the last time that you sat down and wrote an article or anything like that using that initial foundational style? Yeah, I don't even want to tell you. But the thing is, you've got to learn the rules so you can then break them later on. But once you understood those principles right. and understood how it worked, you went, I'm not limited to five par a five paragraph essay. I understand no. how it fits together. I understand how these things relate. I understand what the transitions are meant to be. I can build from that point. And you give yourself more flexibility rather than going, right, I'm going to write another five paragraph essay. Right. It's, uh, but it's you start with foundational principles and initially you treat them as rules until you understand them and then once you've understand them once you have a grip on them then you move on you develop you move further so the same thing with reviewing yeah and i, I and i think it, it's the same thing with almost any skill and reviewing is a skill because it draws oh, yeah. on your your experience your education your perspective it yeah. draws on all of your strengths and in, play into that, lean into those things. Mm -hmm. But also where there are areas that you aren't competent in yet, the yet part is important because they are th skills and things that you can learn. Exactly. And that's what I love about this. Talking to you, talking to other uh, YouTubers, looking and at other people's reviews, I am constantly learning new approaches and new techniques. Yeah, yeah. And that is so valuable. I don't go, oh, I, I've studied this, therefore I don't need to learn anymore. Good. <laughs> no, Lear learning is going to carry on until the day I keel over. Yeah. Um, which if people keep talking about man of steel and my blood pressure keeps rising, <laughs> it might be a bit earlier than an anticipated. <laughs> <laughs> But and it, it ties into like, so the, the reading triangle that I was so proud of. It's a if, nice triangle. It has three corners and uh, three lines. Well, hang on. Let me put it up here and I'll explain what I mean. Yeah, it's a lovely triangle, really, AP. I'll um, give over. But <laughs> if we think of all possible meaning in the text, all possible interpretations are going to be in this triangle. Yep. The only thing that can ever change is the reader. Right. Because when you read a book and you're in a really, really bad mood and you're angry and you're sitting down and you're reading angrily and you're not paying attention, or you sit down even a week later and reread that passage, but you're in a really good mood and you're going through it and you're enjoying things. You can have entirely different reactions to the same passages, but that passage has not changed. And so if you talk only about your feelings, about how it made you feel, about what you enjoyed, that right. is going to be dependent on your mood, on what you ate that day, on all of these personal factors, plus your personal preferences. But if you talk about elements that are in the text or you talk about elements about when the text was written and what it might, might have uh, filtered into it. Those yeah. elements are fixed yeah. and they never change. The only thing that changes is the reader. If you read a book when you were 15, if you read a book when you were 25, um, looking back on some of our favorite texts 
that we read as children. And you might think, how did I ever like this drivel? Yeah, yeah. Um, but when we read them as children, we were like, this is the world's greatest novel ever written. Yeah, it's interesting because when you think about it in terms of reviewing again, um, when and I'll relate this back to the, uh, the college that I went to. I go back and I look at the transcripts for, of what I did and I read again those evaluations. And wow, I'm right back there learning again. And I read what the professor said about me. I read what I said about myself. And it's just such a wonderful thing. And so vivid, as opposed to looking back on a transcript, which has a bunch of letters on it, A, B, whatever. So to me, the value there of a, of a review is definitely going to be, in, in if let's say I, I wrote a review and I have a star rating on it. And I go back years later and maybe I'll experience that book very differently the second time. And I give it a very different star rating because either I've outgrown it or I've grown to appreciate this kind of writing more or whatever. I, I've changed. The star rating is seems a bit arbitrary at that point. But what I wrote about it is something that will revive my experience of reading the book that first time. And I'll understand what I was doing and what I was what why, you know, the the why is there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I I just think there's tremendous value in that kind of written analysis and the again the more tools you can bring to bear on that the better i think um so whereas the star rating as fun as it can be in the moment i think is is not going to be as important in the long run but yeah and i mean reading reading is such a personal activity yeah and anything that helps us communicate with other people what our personal experience was yeah. And to engage in that conversation is a good thing. No one, no one is saying otherwise. Yeah. But we have to be aware of, are we reviewing the text? Or are we articulating how we felt about the text? Right. Or are we constructing something that we're calling a review that is doing both or only one? Like, mm. And just calling, oh, well, every, every time I talk about books, I'm reviewing them. Well, that clearly can't be true. No, I can't. It. Right. Um, and that's academics are obsessed with definitions. Academics are obsessed with trying to pin down these things in in a way that not only do we understand it, but we can clearly communicate it to someone else. Yeah. And I think that's that's what I, I wanted to talk to you about today, because yeah. we obviously both care very passionately about literature. Mm hmm um dedicated significant parts of our lives to the study of it and what we chose to do with that was share that knowledge and experience with other people not yeah. to shut people out not to shut people down but to right. go here's what we learned we spent ages doing this here you go yeah and uh yet you will have people and i know people call me pretentious because, oh, well, you use complicated language and you think you're so smart that you go, sorry, should I pretend to be dumb? <laughs> what, what do you want me to do? This is how I speak. This is how I talk. Um, yeah. Am I not allowed to be myself? Well, I think the point, though, is what you're offering. And I, I, I think it's important because you're offering, I'm just speaking for myself. You're offering me tools. Uh, and when you use these ter the, the terminology that I probably am more familiar with, with it than than other people, but you've used terms that I wasn't familiar with before. Um, so again, I picked on you for the diegetic thing and extra diegetic and and all hypodiegetic and all of that. It's actually valuable. When you talked about that, my my reaction wasn't oh my god, why is he using these complicated words? It was that's cool. That's a way to open up a new understanding of this text that I didn't see before because I now have a name for this concept that, oh, this makes sense, you know? So having a name for the concept gives me a more nuanced understanding of what I'm evaluating. And that's what you're offering. And I think it's pretty damn cool, not pretentious, so. Well, thank you very much for that. But we see it, like 1984, George Orwell's 1984 is a great example of this. Why do you need all of these different words to say some how good something is? You have good, 
plus good, double plus good. There you go. <laughs> We're, we've encompassed the entire range. You no longer need any other words to describe something positively. You, you That's have the society three we all want to live in, right? Yeah. <laughs> and you go, right, so out of the whole of the English language, we're, we're just going to narrow down to the, okay, okay. But that that's why we, we get obsessed with these things. We, we sometimes quibble about very minor distinctions. That in casual conversation, you'll say, oh, you know what I mean. Yeah. But you don't always have that opportunity to say, oh, you know what I mean, and have the feedback for someone to say yes, because yeah. You record a video, you put the video up, and a week later, you're looking at some of the comments and you go, I thought I'd made that clearer. And then you play, <laughs> yeah. it, you play it back and go, no, in my head, it was very clear, but what I right. said was gibberish. <laughs> really have to address this. It can happen. We all do it. Oh, yeah. yeah but sure. thank you so much for joining me on this, Philip. This has been a, a fun and I hope interesting discussion for, for the viewers. Yeah. Yeah, it's been fun for me for sure, um, and you know it's 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 kind of our bread and butter. So uh, it, we enjoy talking about it, but I do think that there's a there's a valuable place for this kind of discussion um, on uh, on BookTube as well. So hopefully your viewers will agree. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support, and we'll see you in the next one.